Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's get started and look into our daily quiz. Let's look into the first question. Consider the following statements with respect to Indian flapshell turtle. It is only found in India, Bangladesh and Pakistan. Its IUCN status is vulnerable. These turtles are omnivorous. Which of the above statements is our correct? The answer to this is 2 and 3 only. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the Hindu makes a mention of Indian flapshell turtle. Let us try and understand what are these options. When we look into the first option, it is wrong. Why? Because they are not only found in India, Bangladesh and Pakistan, but they are also found in Sri Lanka, Nepal and Myanmar as well. Because they are found in the South Asian part, because they are found in other countries as well. The answer to this would be 2 and 3. Yes, the second statement is right. Its IUCN status is vulnerable. And yes, these turtles are omnivorous as well because they feed on frogs, fishes, snails and they also feed on plant leaves, flowers, fruits, so on and so forth. What are the threats to these turtles? When it comes to these turtles, they basically live in the shallow waters. They also live and prefer to live in the sand and mud bottoms because they also have the tendency to burrow as well. Because of this attribute, when there is construction of dams or cultivation along the river banks or we are polluting these regions this becomes a major threat to the survival of the turtles because they live in shallow waters because there is pollution or we construct dams and barrages this can become a major threat to these turtles apart from this freshwater turtles and their eggs are commonly considered as a protein rich food and there is a myth as well that these turtle meats and eggs have aphrodisiac quality because of it they are being killed and their eggs are also being drawn and this becomes another major threat for this particular species. If we speak about the conservation status, yes, it is also protected under the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 in Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. Now let's look into the next practice question. The World Press Freedom Index is an annual ranking of countries compiled and published by is it World Economic Forum, Amnesty International, Economist Group, Reporters Without Borders? The answer to this is Reporters Without Borders. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article here makes a mention of World Press Freedom Index. The World Press Freedom Index is published by a foreign non-governmental organization called as Reporters Without Borders. So remember, this is one of the important indexes which helps us understand or makes an assessment about the press freedom in a particular country. What would happen? There will be questions prepared by this non-governmental organizations. These questions will be asked to the people. It will be asked to the NGOs in that particular country. And on the basis of response that they get, there will be ranking given to a particular country amongst many other countries. So basically, it will try and identify the degree of freedom that journalists in that country have, how new organizations are able to generate information and supply the same to the people. And at the same time, do netizens or citizens in that country, do they have the freedom to voice their opinion against the government and the government policies? Whether there are restrictions imposed on the journalists, are the journalists able to give all the information even if it is against the government? So such will be accessed by this particular organization and ultimately a ranking would be given by this organization. But do remember, this does not rank the government on the basis of quality of the policies that the government comes up with or it does not also speak about the quality of journalism in that country. So the index basically gives us an idea about the freedom the journalists have in that country. Now let's look into the next practice question. Which of the following statements about compassionate employment is our correct? Compassionate employment is not a matter of right. Dependent family of missing government employees can be considered for compassionate appointment. Which of the statements are correct? The answer to this is both. 
why have we taken this practice question because this article here makes a mention of compassionate employment let us try and understand what is this concept of compassionate employment let's say for example we have a garment servant he is working for the government of india what all of a sudden that this person while he is in service passes away or there is a medical emergency that happens to this person because of the job that he is in in this particular backdrop because he was serving the government of india because he was at the service helping the government of india if there is a problem to this particular person and because there are dependents of the family because he is the only breadwinner of this particular family if he does not work the family would not have the financial independence in order to overcome this particular issue the government of india provides what is called as compassionate employment so what is compassionate employment it is where the dependents of this particular person would be provided a job opportunity who are the people if that person is not married it can be the kin if that person is married it can be the wife or the children so if this particular person passes away or he has a medical emergency he is not able to work for the government of india in such a case this deceased person's immediate family or the deceased person's kin if he is not married will be provided this particular job but remember such a job will be offered to the family members only if the financial condition is not good so the government of india has the discretion the government of india can look into multiple aspects and if they feel that he is the only breadwinner the financial conditions of that particular family is not good that is when compassionate employment can be awarded to this particular person so remember compassionate employment is not a right that a family can ask for so the government of india using its discretion looks at multiple things and ultimately awards this compassionate employment which is a discretion and it is not a matter of right so that is why the first option is correct and when we look into the second statement the second statement is also right but if that particular person is missing it has to be greater than 2 years as well so if a particular person's job has to be given to the family members that person should have been missing for more than 2 years and fir will have to be filed in the police station the missing person should not be traceable and the competent authority will look into this particular case and if it is genuinely found and if the person is missing then the family member can be given compassionate employment as well but if the person is missing and his retirement period is less than 2 years of age or he is suspected to have committed a fraud or he has joined any of the terrorist organization or suspected to have gone abroad in such a case this will not be provided so the point to remember is the dependent family of the missing government employees can also be considered for the compassionate employment now let's look into the next practice question which of the following are the functions of the enforcement directorate investigating violations of foreign exchange management act laws and provisions investigating offenses of prevention of money laundering act 2002 laws and provisions processing cases of fugitives from india under the fugitive economic offenders act of 2018 ed is also india's officially designated single point of contact for liaison with the interpol which of them are the functions of the enforcement directorate the answer to this is 1 2 and 3 only why have we taken this practice question because this article here makes a mention of enforcement directorate what is the enforcement directorate it is a law enforcement and intelligence agency responsible for enforcing economic laws fighting economic crime in india where is it headquartered it is headquartered in delhi this can be very important from preliminary examination point of view and it is administered by the department of revenue under the ministry of finance it is headed by director of enforcement who is generally an irs officer the point that we have to focus is if you look into the fourth option ed is not india's officially designated single point of contact for liaison with the interpol why that is because this power is given to the central bureau of investigation it is not the power that is accorded to the enforcement directorate but instead this power is given to the central bureau of investigation 
now let's look into the next practice question what is the application of somatic cell nuclear transfer technology production of bio larvicides manufacture of biodegradable plastics reproductive cloning of animals production of organisms free of disease the answer to this is reproductive cloning of animals this happens to be a previous year question from the year 2017 now let's look into the fact of the day. The fact of the day for today's discussion is Belagavi border dispute. Where is the Belagavi? Belagavi is a district in the state of Karnataka. It happens to be a border district between the states of Maharashtra and Karnataka. Belagavi is also called by the name Belgam. Previously it was called as Belgam, but the state of Karnataka changed the name of Belgam to the district of Belagavi. This borders Maharashtra's Kolhapu district. It comprises both the Kannada and the Marathi speaking people and which is where the primary dispute is whether Belagavi which is currently in the state of Karnataka should it be merged with Maharashtra which is the call of the Maharashtra Eki Karan Samiti and the political parties in Maharashtra so this Belagavi which is currently a district in Karnataka is a border dispute between the states of Maharashtra and Karnataka when we look into the colonial times, some of the districts which are now part of Karnataka was part of the Ernst Weil Bombay Presidency. Let's say for example Vijayapura, Belagavi, Darwad and Uttara Kannada were under the Ernst Weil Bombay Presidency. This continued until 1956. But in the year 1956, what we had is the State Reorganization Act of 1956. According to the State Reorganization Act, some of the districts which were under Ernst while Bombay presidency was added into the part of Karnataka. So basically what happened on the basis of the 1881 census which identified that 64.39% of the population of Belagavi as Kannada speaking and 26.04% as Marathi speaking because the majority were from the Kannada speaking section which is why Belagavi was added as the district of Karnataka. So the State Reorganization Act ensures that Belagavi becomes part of Karnataka. This is where issues were raised by Maharashtra. Why? Because according to Maharashtra, they personally believe that there are more number of Marathi speaking people in the Belagavi district rather than Kannada speaking people. So they go against this particular initiative and they also voiced their opinion with the government of India back in the year 1957. They petitioned the government of India. They also speak to the government of India and after making multiple consultations, they the government of India appoints one of the committee called as the Maharajan Commission. So the Union government back in the year 1966 sets up what is called as the Maharajan Commission to look into the border disputes between the state of Karnataka and Maharashtra. So the commission was headed by former Chief Justice of India, Meherchan Mahajan. He looks into multiple issues. He speaks to the people in this particular area, receives multiple memorandums after making multiple consultations with people in Karnataka and Maharashtra, he finally says that about 264 Marathi dominant villages will have to be shifted from Karnataka to Maharashtra. So those areas which are currently in the state of Karnataka in Belagavi, they will have to be given to Maharashtra, says this Mahajan Commission. And at the same time, it insisted that Karnataka would retain Belagavi and 247 villages. So the major city of Belagavi city will be with Karnataka and 247 villages will be with Karnataka, says the Mahajan Commission. So the Mahajan Commission was placed in front of the parliament. The views of Maharashtra government and Karnataka government was taken into picture. So accordingly, Karnataka government did accept this particular proposal. But Maharashtra government back then rejects this particular proposal. And even after this particular report was laid in front of the parliament, the union government has yet not implemented the Mahajan Commission report. So basically, we have the Maharashtra government which did not like or it did not want to implement the Mahajan Commission report, which is why it heads to the Supreme Court of India. So the Maharashtra government approached the Supreme Court of India to settle this particular dispute under Article 131 of the Indian Constitution. But the Supreme Court case is still pending before the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court has not delivered the judgment about this dispute between the states of Karnataka and Maharashtra. 
Maharashtra. On one side, you have Maharashtra saying that this part should be given to Maharashtra. On the other side, you have Karnataka saying that the State Reorganization Act has clearly laid a border. This means it's a settled issue. If we open the Pandora's box, what we will have is more border disputes in the near future. And this will harm the peace and tranquility along the border areas. It is this that we have to understand in reference to this article. So this is it for today. Thank you for watching. All the best.